And now we are very excited to introduce our next speaker, Dr. John Scanling. Um, please welcome Dr. Scanling. Uh, let me do a little quick bio here, if you don't mind. Dr. Scanling is an MD, transplant nephrologist, and the medical director of Stanford Adult Kidney and Pancreas Transplantation. He's the program director for Stanford Nephrology Fellowship Training Program, the program director for Stanford Transplant Nephrology Fellowship Training Program. We want to welcome uh, Dr. Scanling, who will be discussing and educate, ed educating us on the science of matching uh, for kidney transplant patients. He's going to discuss their new research program for three out of four of six HLA match. So please welcome Dr. Scanling. Thank you for the invitation to be here this afternoon. Appreciate it. And uh, I, I tell you, geez, if you can understand that insurance stuff, you can certainly understand understand what we're trying to do. Uh, when I, while I was putting this together, it dawned on me that I actually gave this talk, or actually something like it, uh, to your national meeting three years ago, almost to the day. Actually, the meeting was in Nashville. Um, so, but this one's good. This, I'm going to give you more than I gave them at that time. So, special. Anyway, so I'm speaking on behalf of my co-investigators who are shown here on this slide. I'm not sure you can read them from the back, perhaps. But Dr. Boosk is here, who's my counterpart in transplant surgery. He's the surgical director of the program. And our transplant coordinator, Asha, is going to try to, I'll see here. Oh, OK. I need new glasses. <coughs> um, and I see they're not covered by Medicare. I don't know about that. <laughs> Why, you know, I mean, I was thinking about that when I was sitting there. I was thinking, you know, so vision, hearing, taste, speech, I think like dentures, they don't cover dentures. Seems to me those things ought to be, those are like essential. I mean, that's how you interact with other people. That's how you survive. It's, uh, I, don't quite, I don't quite get that one. I think it'd be smarter to cover those things and drop some of the other stuff that they cover. Anyway, so also shown, other members of the team include bone marrow transplant specialists, and you'll see why in a few minutes. <clears throat> and also, uh, Dr. Strober's name is there. He's the, the last name. He's the senior member of our team. He's the inventor of this protocol. So he's the brain trust of the group. So. Transplant tolerance, that's what we're, that's our primary subject to speak about this afternoon. And even amongst our own colleagues, we have naysayers. So <clears throat> this is a quote from Randy Morris. Now Randy Morris is uh, one of our colleagues at Stanford. Um, he's actually emeritus now, but still active in the field of transplantation. Dr. Morris was very instrumental in bringing Mycophenolate Mofetil, brand name Celsep, from the clinic, from the, excuse me, the laboratory to the clinic. And he was also instrumental in bringing Sirolimus, brand name Rapimune, from the laboratory to the clinic. He did a lot of the preclinical work, meaning experimental work in experimental animals that brought those drugs to transplantation. Anyway, his quote, tolerance is the future and always will be. So he's not quite on board with us, but he may be coming around. So what's, what about kidney transplantation today? So for many, it's the better choice, better than dialysis. But it's just that, it's a choice. It's not mandatory. Transplant is life improving. But it's not life-saving. Now, you may disagree, but it's not life-saving. The alternative is dialysis. You can live on dialysis. You may not like it, but you can live on dialysis. And indeed, only 20% of people on dialysis are listed for transplantation. That's it, one in five. So transplantation requires medication to suppress the immune system to prevent rejection of the transplanted organ such that at one year following kidney transplantation in the United States, two-thirds of transplant recipients are on three immunosuppressive drugs. One-third are on two immunosuppressive drugs, and there are not very many, a few percent 
are on only one immunosuppressive drug. Immunosuppression carries risk. So what is the <coughs> definition of tolerance? Well, tolerance, as you can read here, is the specific absence of a destructive immune response to a transplanted tissue without immunosuppression. So what might be the benefits of tolerance? Well, there's a number of freedoms that come with it. Freedom from rejection of the transplanted organ. Freedom from the complications of immunosuppression, which are infection in the short term primarily, but can also be in the long term. Freedom from malignancy, which is typically more of a long term complication of immunosuppression. And then aside from that, it frees you from the immunosuppressive drug side effects, specifically nephrotoxicity. That means toxicity to the kidney. That may seem strange, you know, why are we using drugs like Tacrolimus or Prograf is the brand name uh, to prevent rejection if it's harmful to the transplanted organ, kidney in our case. Well, the reality is there's nothing better. It's the cornerstone. There's nothing better than Tacrolimus in terms of preventing rejection of the transplanted organ. The other drug side effects, which can be problematic, or diabetes, high blood pressure, and high cholesterol and lipids. So what are the goals we're aiming at? We're aiming to reduce premature death, reduce premature graft loss, graft meaning the transplanted organ. We want to extend the expiration date of the transplanted organ, and ideally, there would be one transplant kidney for life. You'd be transplanted once and that would be it. You would not need to be retransplanted. Remember that the average life expectancy of a kidney from a living donor is about 15 years on average. From a deceased donor, it's about 10 years on average. So how can we induce this state of tolerance? Well, the way we do it is through the development of chimerism. And the definition of chimerism is the presence of foreign, meaning donor, blood cells in the recipient. And where does the word chimerism come from? It comes from this being, this, I guess it's not actually a being because it's mythical, but <clears throat> this is a chimera. It was a being in Greek mythology. And this chimera actually was unearthed in Arezzo in Italy back around 1500 or so. It dates to, the, the actual statue itself dates to, to uh, before, you know, back to the fourth of this century before Christ. <clears throat> anyway, this mythical figure, as you can see, is made up of three different animals. So lion, head of a goat, tail, a fire-breathing serpent. So that's a chimera. And these two fellows, were instrumental in the early investigation into chimerism as the pathway to tolerance. So the first observation of chimerism was an adult fraternal twin, twin cattle by Ray Owen when he was uh, only in his 20s as a post, he was a postdoctoral student at that point. And then the first demonstration of actively acquired immune tolerance was in mice, and that was by Medawar and colleagues. And what we learned from their work is that the chimeric immune system recognizes the transplant itself. So if we can develop this chimerism, then we can prevent rejection of the transplanted organ. And you can see they did this work back in the 40s and 50s, so this is, you know, we've been at this now for decades. I'll leave it to you to uh, guess which one was the American. <laughs> so there are two types of chimerism that we uh, talk about and you might hear about or read about if you read about tolerance projects and kidney transplantation. The first is complete chimerism, wherein all the blood cells are of donor origin. So this is the goal of bone marrow transplantation. You want to replace the recipient's immune system with the donor's immune system to kill the cancer, to 
to eradicate the cancer. The goal of our protocol is mixed chimerism, wherein you have a variable number of donor cells of different types. Right? So we're not looking for complete chimerism in our protocol, we're looking for mixed chimerism. So what is required to achieve chimerism? Well, it requires transplantation of blood stem cells from the kidney donor along with the kidney transplant. And it involves some challenges. The first is getting the donor cells to stick and stay in the recipient. And this is even a greater challenge when there is a tissue, HLA stands for human leukocyte antigen mismatch. We'll talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. And then, if you do achieve this state of chimerism where the cells stick and stay, you have a risk of the donor cells attacking the recipient. And that's called graft versus host disease. And that's a very real risk in bone marrow transplantation. Now, blood cell <coughs> transplantation requires a conditioning regimen. And the reason why is you need to, quote, make room in the bone marrow for the transplanted cells. And this, but this conditioning regimen carries risk, and that's risk of suppression of the bone marrow and consequent infection. Now looking at uh, these conditioning regimens, or regimens, as I mentioned, there are other tolerance projects at other institutions in the United States too, essentially. Uh, one at Northwestern in Chicago, and the second at Massachusetts General Hospital in Boston. Uh, there are some others starting to come online, but as of now, uh, those two centers in Stanford are the three centers that have been at this for some time. So the components of the conditioning regimen at the other sites are sort of classical in that they involve chemotherapy, which is typically what you would go through if you were going to have a bone marrow transplantation to treat cancer. And also it involves radiation of the thymus, which is a, a gland uh, here high in the chest. Uh, as we age, it actually involutes, meaning it gets smaller and smaller and actually eventually disappears. But it's important in the development of the immune system when we're uh, young. Or it involves <coughs> a radiation of the, the whole body. This is, a, this is low dose of radiation. Now the Stanford conditioning regimen is a bit different. Instead of chemotherapy, we use antithymocyte globulin. Now this is something that over 60% of kidney transplant recipients receive anyway in the United States. So this is nothing new to, to transplant patients. But the second component is total lymphoid irradiation, or TLI is the abbreviation. And this is based on work it started back in the 1970s at Stanford uh, by Dr. Sam Stroper, who I mentioned earlier, and his colleagues at that time who achieved stable mixed chimerism intolerance in adult mice using total lymphoid irradiation. So here's another example of preclinical work or work in experimental animals that is the base of future work in humans. So what is total lymphoid irradiation? Well, it was originally designed as the treatment for Hodgkin's disease. So back in the 60s, Stanford actually um, was on the forefront of uh, radiation therapy. Dr. Kaplan, who led that effort, was uh, a distinguished uh, investigator at that time. So TLI, <coughs> it's safe and effective. It's delivered in multiple small doses is targeted specifically to the lymph nodes, the spleen, and the thymus. The other tissues are purposely shielded, so the vital organs, the lungs, the heart, etc., are shielded so that they are not hit by the radiation. And it's an outpatient procedure. And the dose that's used in our protocol is about 20 to 25 percent of the dose that's typically used to treat cancer. So it's much less than the dose that's used to treat cancer. So the donor, as I mentioned earlier, the donor has to donate both blood stem cells and the kidney. So what does the donor have to go through? 
So the donor receives treatment for five days with a medication to stimulate the release of blood stem cells from the bone marrow into the blood. And then this is followed by what's called leukapheresis, which is very similar to dialysis, except that <clears throat> the blood stem cells are removed from the circulation, not the waste products. Remember, hemodialysis removes your waste products and excess fluid. This just removes the blood stem cells. It's called leukapheresis because it's primarily white blood cells. And this is done <clears throat> about six weeks or more before the kidney transplant. And I put or more in there because we can actually store these cells almost indefinitely. So turning now to the recipient's procedures. So our practice has been to do the kidney transplant on Monday in this protocol. So the transplant is, is uh, <clears throat> put in place on Monday, and the recipient starts to receive, receive the first dose of this ATG. This is the antithymus like globin I mentioned earlier. The little R stands for rabbit because it's raised in rabbits. And <clears throat> receives that uh, in, the, uh, excuse me, in the operating room and continues to, uh, on for several hours thereafter. And goes on to finish uh, four more doses during that first week after the kidney transplant. On the second day, Tuesday, the uh, total lymphoid irradiation course is started. Again, it's given in small fractions, 10 fractions over a course of days. And the recipient also starts on conventional immunosuppression, meaning prednisone, mycophilic mofetil, tacrolimus. And the individual will be on a combination of these various agents for up to a year to 18 months, depending upon the protocol. So after the first week, the, uh, the, the recipient is uh, discharged on Friday afternoon, goes home, has the weekend off, comes back on Monday, and completes the course of the irradiation on an outpatient basis. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, two doses on Thursday, one on Thursday morning, one on Thursday afternoon, a fifth dose on uh, Friday morning, and then the cell transplant is uh, its just a simple transfusion and only takes a number of minutes. Uh, it's done on Friday afternoon. And that cell transplant is made up of the, the CD34 cells, which are the stem cells, and from which all the other cells come. And then also a population of CD3 cells, which are also known as T cells. And you need these cells to actually get these cells to stick and stay. If you don't have these, you don't get these to stick and stay. That's something we learned along the way here. These cells also can be the bad actors. These cells can cause the graft versus host disease. So when we first started, we only gave a very small number of these cells because the last thing we wanted to do was actually cause graft versus host disease in a kidney transplant recipient. We don't think any kidney transplant recipient wants graft versus host disease in the equation of a kidney transplant. So we started out with a very low number, but as time went by, we learned from our bone marrow transplant colleagues that you have to have enough of these cells to get these guys to stick and stay. So we slowly ratcheted this up over time. And it's a slow process, because every time we would make an increase, you have to wait and see how it goes. And when I say wait, it means months or even you know a couple years before you see how it goes and then you move on to the next set of patients. So this is a very slow process. Anyway, if all goes well, <clears throat> the plan is to go on and withdraw the immunosuppression completely if we have this state of stable mixed chimerism for anywhere from six to 12 months, depending upon the protocol. There's no evidence of rejection of the transplant kidney, and there's no graft versus host disease. That GBHD is graft versus host disease. So what are we looking for in terms of chimerism? Hopefully you can see this. Um, but we're looking for, as I mentioned earlier, mixed chimerism. We're not looking for complete chimerism. If it was complete chimerism, 
You know, you'd be up here, all the cells would be 100%. But what's shown here is a variety of different immune cells. And on average, they're anywhere from about 50 to 60%. And we're primarily interested in these guys in the green, these granulocytes, and these guys in the blue, the B cells. If we can get cells of that cut of those types to stick and stay, then odds are very good that this is going to persist over time, the state of mixed chimerism. So there are two clinical trials. The first we started in 2005, and that was the HLA matched or HLA identical trial. It's a living donor trial. The donor must be an HLA identical sibling. I'll tell you more about that in a few minutes. This was essentially our proof of principle trial, meaning if we could not achieve this in this population, this, this chimerism intolerance, if we could not achieve it in this population, we would not be able to achieve it in any other. Because this is the, the bar is lower here for achieving the chimerism in the tolerance. This is now a sponsored multicenter trial in the US, Canada, and I just learned it's actually gonna be in Europe as well. Dr. Fatty, who's gonna speak after me, will tell you more about that trial. That trial is sponsored by Meteor, who is one, is this one of your sponsors, or maybe the sponsor of today's session. The goal is complete drug cessation. This trial, however, will directly benefit a relatively small number of individuals because not many of us are lucky enough to have an HLA identical donor. An HLA identical donor can only be a sibling donor. Back in the 1990s, about 2,000 of the kidney transplants done a year in the United States were HLA identical. Now it's only about 700. I don't really know the reasons, but I think it probably has to do with the changing demographics, meaning that families are smaller, and, old, and that the families that had large sibships, for example, my, my I'm one of six, was sort of a thing of the past. We don't see a lot of families with that many sibs any longer. So the HLA mismatch, which we started in 2010, is what we're still working on primarily at Stanford. And it's presently a living donor trial. But this actually can, could be done in deceased donor transplantation as well. And we have a project <coughs> uh, underway to do that in coming years. The donor in this case is not HLA identical. The donor is HLA mismatched. I've labeled this sort of the utility trial, meaning you know, what will be the utility of this, of this procedure if we're successful here. This one will be able to use in a lot of different populations. As I mentioned, it's a work in progress. And as I mentioned, it's, it's not, uh, it's anything but quick. The ultimate goal is complete drug cessation but we're in a state now where our goal, <clears throat> if we can't get the complete drug cessation, is actually drug minimization, such that the recipient is on one drug instead of two or three drugs. As you saw earlier, not very many, very many people are actually on one drug. And this trial has the promise to benef benefit many because it can be used in mismatched individuals. So a little bit about HLA typing. So here we have two parents, and each parent has two haplotypes. All right, haplotype, this is one haplotype, this is a second haplotype, and one parent, and this is one and two in the other parent. So when you look at the offspring, with, it, with relation to the parent, each child has a 25% chance of in being, <coughs> uh, having the, uh, a yellow bar here and a red bar. Each child has a chance of having 
the yellow bar and the blue bar, and one haplotype from each parent. Again, one, <clears throat> the 25% chance of the green bar or the red bar, et cetera. So <clears throat> you can be a complete match with one of your siblings as the notified the two that are at the stars. Okay, so those are HLA matched. And they could be actually HLA identical. We do more sophisticated testing now to determine if somebody is a true identical match, which could even include fingerprinting. Or you can see this individual here is a half match with this individual, right? They share this one, so that's a one haplotype match. Or it can be a complete mismatch. So you can see this yellow and red is a complete mismatch from this green and blue over here. And occasionally you can get what's called crossover or recombination of these uh, of the genes that result in these proteins being expressed. And you can actually have a mix. And you can, so you can actually be even more different from a sibling. So as I mentioned, there are two trials. Let's turn to the results. So number one, safety. Safety first. We've had no graph versus, oh, let me back up. So this, we're looking at the HLA match trial here. Okay, again, this is the trial we started first in 2005. It's the proof of principles trial. So safety first, we've had no graft versus host disease, and there's been no added risk to the transplant kidney. Turning to efficacy or success, 24 of the 29 participants were completely withdrawn from drug. And 21 have been off drug anywhere from one to 10 years. Three of the 24 have had to return to drug. One developed an acute rejection episode four years after being off drug. I had to go back. We were able to uh, treat that episode and the individual went back on drug. And two had recurrence of kidney disease that resulted in returning to drug. So unfortunately, kidney disease can come back in the transplanted kidney. It usually does not, but it can. And sometimes it can take the transplanted kidney just like it took the native kidneys. So, so we have some people off drug. You might say, okay, so what? Um, well, taking a, a look at the individuals that were off drug at two years after transplantation versus people who were on drug, not in this study, but just our standard conventionally treated patients, looking at those people at two years after transplantation, the differences between the two groups Fewer people in this group had high blood pressure than in the treated, this conventionally treated individuals. Now some may say, well, how come they had high blood pressure at all? Well, you have to remember, you still, there's still only one kidney, not two. And you come into transplantation with a long history of chronic kidney disease. And some changes have occurred as a consequence of chronic kidney disease which did not necessarily melt away after transplantation. But anyway, we saw less, lesser frequency of high blood pressure in these individuals, lesser frequency of elevated lipids, meaning cholesterol and triglycerides, and we saw no diabetes in these individuals, where we saw diabetes already in several individuals even two years after <laughs> transplantation on the conventional therapy. So let's turn to the HLA mismatch trial. Again, safety first. No graft versus host disease. And no added risk to the transplanted kidney. But as I mentioned, this is a challenging work still in progress. 
three of the 22 participants to date, and we've got several more in the queue, that were withdrawn from drug. And presently, none continue off drug. All three had to return to drug, one for an acute rejection episode, which again was treated, and the individual went back on maintenance therapy. And two returned to drug because they lost their chimerism. Now in the first study, the MATCH study, two-thirds of the individuals lost their chimerism over time after coming off drug. And we really didn't know what was going to happen. But lo and behold, they did not reject the kidney, despite the absence of chimerism, at least chimerism that we can measure. So we can measure the chimerism in the bloodstream. So we can take a sample of blood, and we can determine in that sample of blood uh, which of the immune cells are from the donor and which are from the recipient. Now, it's possible that somebody who does not have those immune cell, donor immune cells in their circulation has them in their bone marrow. But we have not asked any patients to go through a bone marrow aspiration or biopsy to determine whether or not those immune cells were there and not in the circulation. Anyway, as I mentioned, two-thirds of the individual in the MASH trial lost their chimerism after coming off drug and did not get into trouble with rejection, with the exception of the one individual I mentioned. In this trial, on the other hand, <coughs> we're, we are of the mind that if the individual loses the chimerism, they're going to go on and lose the kidney, or they're going to go on and have a rejection and lose the kidney, potentially. So we don't want that to happen. Now, these people are under very close surveillance, so if they do have a rejection, we can treat it and put them back on drug. But that's our current thinking about this, is that <clears throat> if you lose the chimerism, you're going to end up with a rejection. Anyway, of the 22, seven ended up on a single drug. So a third are on a single drug, which you could, you know, from when we talk to potential participants in this trial, you know, they think that that's pretty good. Um, it's not a home run. Maybe it's a double. Kind of depends upon your viewpoint. You know, you're a, one of the, are you a glass half full or a glass half empty type of person? And as I mentioned, <clears throat> our current thinking is that you've got to have persistence to the chimerism to successfully withdraw the drug. So that's our working premise right now. So going forward, we're not going to withdraw a drug completely unless the chimerism is there. If the chimerism disappears, we're going to ask the individuals to go back on drug. When they go back on drug, we put them on a single drug. So <clears throat> there are two clinical trials enrolling. The first is the HLA matched, HLA identical trial, and that's sponsored by Meteor. And this is just the, late, the name of the study, it's the MDR 101, which is Meteor. You know, that's their first trial, so it's, that's why it's 101, I guess. And uh, so if you're interested in, in participating, and so Stanford's a study site for this trial. This is a multi center trial, which means it's being done at a number of centers across the United States, as I mentioned. Canada and also Europe. Indeed, there are a couple other centers around the world that have actually done this outside of the trial. They've taken our protocol and have done this. It's been done in Zurich and it's been done in Tel Aviv. Um, so if you're, but we are a study site and if, if you're, as I mentioned earlier, if you're lucky enough to have an HLA identical donor, ASHA, who's here, is the study coordinator for that trial, and this is her contact information. Now, the HLA mismatch trial is, you know, our trial, our primary trial here at Stanford. And this is sponsored by the National Institutes of Health and also by the California Institute for Regenerative Med Medicine. And again, <clears throat> um, our contact person is Asha. So a little more detail on what's required to be uh, 
a participant in the mismatch trial. You've got to live within a two hour drive or a two hour flight of Stanford. You've got to be less than 60 at the years of age at the time of the transplant. You cannot have a kidney disease at a higher risk for recurrence. It's got to be the first transplant. Subsequent transplants have a higher risk of rejection. And <clears throat> so it's typical that in uh, any trial of new therapies in transplantation, it's restricted to first transplants. You have to have the same blood type as the donor, okay? Not compatible, but the same. So first, that means if the donor is an O, the recipient's got to be an O. You see, a, a donor, an O donor could donate a kidney to anybody. Okay, O is the universal donor, but for the purposes of this trial, the, the recipient has to match the donor. Um, where are we? Oh yeah. So <clears throat> you have to have at least a two HLA match one of which being a DR match with the donor. This is actually loosened up. We just are now loosening it. We were before restricting this to one haplotype match donors. There can be no what's called donor-specific antibody, meaning that the recipient has antibody directed at the donor's HLA proteins. You cannot have what's called a panel reactive antibody higher than 80%. If you have an antibody level that's higher than 80%, you're what's, you're what's called highly sensitized, and there's a higher risk of rejection in that instance. You have to have had <clears throat> uh, essentially mononucleosis. That's what Epstein-Barr virus is. Most of us have mono mononucleosis as part of growing up, you don't even realize you've had the infection because generally speaking, it's just like a cold. You don't get the full-blown mononucleosis. Not many people get the full-blown mononucleosis. So 80% of the adult population in the United States has antibody to this virus. And that means that at some point in their lifetime, they were infected by the virus. And so <clears throat> you've got to be antibody positive unless the donor is antibody negative, in which case, <clears throat> Um, you, there's no risk of transmission of this virus. So if the donor were EBV antibody positive and the recipient were EBV antibody negative, there'd be risk of transmission of this virus from the donor to the recipient. And so you might say, so what? Well, if you're on immunosuppression, it can be a lot more than a cold that you get with this infection. You can actually get something that's called post-transplant liver proliferative disorder. And you better stay away from that. The risk of that after transplantation is very low. It's less than 1%, but it happens. And then you find, finally, you've got to have medical insurance that will cover your transplantation at Stanford. Not all payers um, will allow patients to uh, come to Stanford for transplantation. So donor-specific antibody, let's see if this works. Yeah, here we go. So <clears throat> what's shown here are these different HLA types. So this, here's a kidney. And you know, normally a kidney is about the size of a fist. Anyway, <clears throat> and these things are microscopic. They're not that big. So, <clears throat> so this individual has uh, you know, a variety of uh, HLA antigens on here, and shown here is an antibody directed at this antigen right here, A2. So <clears throat> the problem is if you have one of these guys going in to the transplant, it can be bad news. And then after transplant, you can actually develop more antibodies if your immunosuppression is insufficient. And then, so th these we call de novo because they came after the transplant. So antibody-mediated rejection is not good. Here you have a happy kidney. It's got the HLA-2 antigen. But the 
donor has or develops antibody directed at that HLA-2, which then latch onto the kidney. And then you get activation of the immune system. And then you have a very sad kidney. So that's why we have to stay away from donor-specific antibody. So in conclusion, many thanks to our study participants who we see as our pioneers. Thank you for your attention. Does anyone have a question? Oh, here we go. So let me uh, ask Dr. Let me ask Dr. Boos to come up as well because he may be better able to answer a question, some of the questions that I have. Have you done anything with cord blood? For example, if you've kept the cord blood of one child and then they have the same blood type and so on. So yeah, that's a very good question. And so you you uh, it would work only if that child's big. Okay, so the question is, uh, you know, we're looking at bone marrow from the donor. And here we say, well, if we have bank in the past, uh, cord blood, which is the, the blood uh, when the, the, at the time of birth of, the, uh, of the, the baby can be stored because the cord blood is less immunogenic and it's used for bone marrow transplant. But in our purpose, Purpose, it would have to be the same as the, the donor of the eventual organ. So it's not just the possibility of getting a successful bone marrow transplant with less graft graft disease. It has to carry all the antigens of the donor. So in that case, is, would that be better to use the cord blood? Let's say, for example, the 20 years later, that baby becomes a donor to a, to a sibling. Uh, would that be better to use that cord blood? or to do the process we're using right now. So possibly, yes, maybe it's less, less risk of Grasso's disease, but that would be very, very small chance of being lucky enough to have, have this in the past. So it's a very good question because there there's, could be maybe advantages in that case, but maybe unlikely to, to align all the stars to make it happen. What kind of kidney disease is that high risk for recurring after transplantation? Atypical hemolytic uremic syndrome is uh, one that recurs at a very high rate. There are also some, uh, there, there's some, there's a category of, of diseases that are kind of being renamed um, that can recur at a high rate as well. There's a, all the C3 glomerulonephritides. Um, it gets a little complex when you start getting into the weeds with this, but those are the uh, primary bad actors. So we have to be, and yeah, we have to pick and choose. We have to be careful to avoid diseases that might come back. Sometimes they come back with a vengeance. Thank you. Yes. Hi, for the HLA identical study, if you have a half sibling that's an exact match, is that good enough? Uh, you can't be an exact match with a half sibling. You can't happen to just have well, it's possible that you, I suppose it's possible that you could match at those six, you know, that I showed there, each parent having three, uh, a haplotype, each one is uh, three and three. Mm -hmm. But we do much more sophisticated testing now that actually looks at the genes. We've done the, the matching at the gene level. It's very unlikely that you're going to match the gene level with a half sip. You may match at the protein level, which is the, the first uh, pass testing, if you will. But nowadays, we go beyond that to the more sophisticated typing. Yeah. For any of the tolerance programs, um, trials that are being done, are they considering second transplant? Not that I'm aware of, you know? Um, I think Northwestern have done some. I'm not sure if they're, they're still doing second transplant. So, oh, actually, uh, yeah, I should mention it. So, actually, the first patient at MGH was a retransplant. Yeah, I forgot about that. Yes? When, when the patient ends up on only one drug, what drug is it? It's usually to call us. Because, as I mentioned earlier, it's the cornerstone drug 
Uh, but you might run across individuals who are just on cell step. You might run across people who are just on rapid. They're unusual, but they're out there. And there aren't many, you know, as I said, there aren't many of them, but they're out there. Sorry? I'm curious if you've been following the donors in your, your identical match. Uh, we're uh, mandated by UNOS, which was the United Network for Organ Sharing, uh, to see all donors or follow all donors for the first two years after donation. There's no requirement that the donors be followed beyond that two year point. So uh, we have not been following the donors in a formal way beyond that two-year point. Yes? Um, where do you get the stem cells? I mean, how do you cultivate them? Do you have any opposition to this? Any trouble? So the, uh, <clears throat> the donor receives injections of a medication that causes the bone marrow to release the stem cells from the bone marrow into the circulation. And that's given for four or five days, that we five doses, and then the, that the donor's attached to a machine that looks like a dial, the hemodialysis machine, uh, and uh, the blood is, comes out through the machine, which then removes the stem cells from the circulation returns everything else to the donor. Each one of these sessions takes about, it's very similar to dialysis, takes three or four hours. And the donor may go through uh, one or two of these sessions to ensure that there are enough stem cells uh, to give to the recipient. Do you expect to expand this to not such restricted parameters? More than 60, not a sibling? Um, we're probably not going to change. We've had conversations about changing the, uh, the age of the 65, but we're not there yet. We'll see. As far as uh, not a sibling, yes, we're there now. You don't have to be a sibling. This is, again, in the, the mismatch trial. Yes. In the mismatch trial, what are, what's going to be different uh, in this next phase than was in the previous phase of how you're conducting the study? Well, the uh, one is what we just talked about, uh, in that it doesn't have to be a sibling half match uh, donor. It can be a uh, you know unrelated donor who's not a half match, but it has to be at least a two out of a six match. And again, that matching is at the, see, the sophisticated level, the time where we actually do DNA typing, or the gene typing. That's the major thing from the recipient eligibility. We're doing a couple of other things in terms of trying to improve the possibility of the cells sticking and staying. So we've been focusing on enhancing the cell dose that's given to the recipient. We've also been focusing on adjusting the conditioning regimen. Remember, the conditioning regimen is the ATG and the TLI. Adjusting that to try to enhance the possibility of the cells sticking and staying because we're trying to get the chimerism to last indefinitely. We're not there yet in the mismatch trial. Yeah. How likely is the graft versus host disease as you try to match a mismatch donor? <coughs> well, <coughs> yeah, so uh, good question. It really, we think it really hinges on uh, how well the cells stick and stay. So if you end up with a situation where we go overboard, if you will, when we, we go beyond mixed chimerism and we end up with complete chimerism, we run the risk of there being graft versus host disease. Now, if you have complete chimerism, it doesn't mean you're going to get graft versus host disease because it doesn't happen in all bone marrow transplant patients, but it happens in a healthy percentage. 
And what that means is that the individual has to stay on the immunosuppressive drugs. Sometimes the graft versus disease can be life-threatening. Sometimes it's, a, it's, it's, it's not. And sometimes it goes away over time, such that the, even if the person needed the drugs to keep the graft versus disease under control for a while, eventually it may go away and the drugs could be stopped. Yeah. If you ever had cancer, are you eligible for a transplant? Uh, <clears throat> depends upon the type of the cancer. Depends upon the number of years it's been since the excuse me, since the cancer. So, for example, superficial skin cancers like uh, basal cell cancer, which is very common, even squamous cell cancer, if they've been localized. There's, there's no requirement for what we call a waiting period before transplantation. You can go ahead to transplant. But if you've had something like colon cancer or breast cancer, that could be a, a longer wait. It could be five years is recommended before undergoing transplantation. It's not the surgery. It's the whole state of immunosuppression is the risk. Right? If when you're, because when your immune system is suppressed, the cancer may come back. And the idea is that if you wait longer, the odds of the cancer coming back are going to be less and less as time goes by. But as you know, some cancers are really bad actors and can come back 10, 15 years later. We don't make people wait that long. We just say, you know, you have, you have to realize there's some unknowns here. What about liver cancer and bladder cancer? Depends upon uh, the type of the cancer, uh, not just the organ, but the type and how uh, advanced it was. Do we want to take one more question and then we'll go ahead and move on? Patty, who's waiting. I would like to thank Dr. Bush, who was my surgeon, Dr. Sterling. I've had my transplant since 2004, and at 86, I'm going on strong. Yeah. That's a great note to end on. Thank you, doctors. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Wonderful.